Hey everyone, I'm Melissa from Knitting the Stash and this is episode 53 in the series. I'm coming to you not from the yarn room in Illinois, but from Ithaca, New York, where we're out visiting family for spring break. And today uh, the household is a little more alive and wild than it usually is. So often when I film out here, um, I'm kind of like, I have a day to myself or something like that, but not today. So you might hear dogs wandering around or chewing on bones or people coming and going. And I thought I'd just go for it and give you a sense of like the real life of a podcaster, which is often very complicated. Um, so let's see. I usually introduce myself by saying uh, I'm a professor at the University of Illinois, thus spring break. <laughs> and uh, here out in New York, it is cold. It's like in the 20s at night, 40s during the day. Not terrible for spring break, but it's definitely like we uh, reversed the time clock here a little bit and we've moved back into winter. It's been snowing pretty steadily since we got here, so that's par for the course out here in springtime, right? It is spring this week. Happy spring to everybody. And uh, of course, welcome back to anyone who's coming back to the podcast. I always love to see you and spend some time with you. And welcome to any new viewers. If this is the first time you've ever seen the cast, um, I basically talk a lot about sweaters, a lot of garment uh, DIY, garment modifications, um, lots of fun stuff in that vein. So if you're into those kinds of things, you're in the right place. I also talk about spinning and uh, for 2019, we've got a uh, rare and hard to find out of print book series going on. I have another volume um, for that series today. So what are we gonna talk about? We're gonna talk about, uh, I have a work in progress, which is my Termox sweater from June Cashmere, which is designed by Nora Gone. Thought I'd give you a little preview of that. Uh, I do, like I said, have another book in the series, and this one, it's The History of Spinning in Scotland, which should be kind of fun. Uh, and that's partially why I'm gonna call this episode um, <laughs> Sheep Breeds and Scottish Spinning. So we'll see how, we'll see how we get on with all that. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the yarn launch and uh, actually the next yarn that I'm starting to design. So kind of keep you up to date on where that all is. And uh, Jean Arnold Culliford uh, has a great new series out, a book and a series of e-publication, uh, Year of Techniques, number two, is out. And she's been sending me uh, little updates on that. And the first one came out this March and I wanted to share it with you and give you a preview of it so that if you're interested in getting on board with that, you have plenty of time to do that. And I think her um, techniques, Year of Techniques, are pretty timeless and they will teach you a lot and the tutorials are awesome. I'll talk about those a little bit. Finally, I have a giveaway from Two Frenchy Fibers, so it's a pretty packed episode, as it were. <laughs> Even though traveling out here, uh, we couldn't bring much stuff with us because we had three humans, two dogs, and then a trailer full of stuff behind us, including clothes and all kinds of craziness. So I was surprised I was able to even bring as much as I did. Um, let me jump right in with the uh, Termox sweater. And the Termox sweater is, as I said, designed by Nora Gone. And if you, she's been around for a long time and she's done some recent interviews on Fruity Knitting um, and a couple other places. So she's uh, someone that you likely know. She has a new, like kind of like greatest hits collection out of her patterns. Um, lots of great stuff, and I love her uh, patterns. I think they're really beautiful. She does amazing things with cables most of the time. Um, so the Termox sweater is knit in June cashmere. It's, it was designed for June cashmere, and this is June cashmere, and I've talked about June cashmere on here before. It's just a plain stockinette sweater body, and a couple of sleeves that I've already finished. So these are the three-quarter length sleeves, and they're knit in the flat. Sweater's knit in the round, sleeves are knit in the flat. Kind of cool that way. And then everything gets yoked up, which I'm, I mean, I'm almost at the yoke. Um, and the yoke, you're gonna have to forgive, I don't have all my internets and fancy stuff today, so I'm gonna show you on my phone. This is the Termox sweater. I think you'll be able to see it. There's the yoke. It's a really beautiful yoke. And Termox means swirl in Kyrgyz. Um, and June Kashmir is working with people in Kyrgyzstan to help bring more value to their fiber. And I've talked about the June Cashmere story on a previous episode. So, I so I'll put a link in the notes here to the other episode where I talk about um, the June Cashmere story and introduce you to June Cashmere's yarn. Uh, their yarn is really gorgeous. This is a, the June Sky colorway, which I absolutely love. And they, this is what they call their lace weight. They also have a um, more like a DK weight yarn. I find that the lace weight is closer to a fingering than a D DK. It's not quite a lace, but it is a very fine, beautiful fiber. Um, 
And this sweater uh, is going along really smoothly because <laughs> it's pretty much all stock in it. It's a little bit of a, there's a little bit of a cute hem on it that you can see here, right? It's got some pearl bumps in there. Uh, and then it's all just a few decreases, flat, stockinette, a few increases, and then you add the yoke. And the yoke is actually the really, it's gonna be the fun part of the sweater. Um, and one of the cool things about this sweater is uh, that the sleeves are knit flat. And I did that for my beekeeper cardigan. It was an option for the beekeeper cardigan, as you get, might recall. I think that was back in episode 50 or 51. Uh, and so you can knit sleeves in the flat and then join everything together. Uh, and depending on gauge issues, sometimes if you're gauge swatching uh, in the round or in the flat, you might want to be as consistent as possible. So uh, you might want to make sure the sleeves are knit in the round or knit in the flat, depending on what you know your gauge to be. Um, that way you'll get a more consistent kind of result. All right. Uh, so that's my Termax sweater. And I think it's coming out pretty beautifully. I'm looking forward to getting it all finished and uh, it's gonna be a pretty one, I think. So the next segment is gonna be a little bit about the farm to skein yarns that I've been working on. And I just, I first wanna say thank you to everyone um, for your huge support of Shorn, which was released, um, oh my gosh, it must be a couple weeks ago now. Everything's been sent out, all the packages are done. Um, but you guys supported that yarn and I really appreciate it because it means you not only supported me, but you supported two local to me shepherdesses, um, Kathy of Seven Sisters Farm and Christy of Fox Run Farm in Monticello. Uh, and there, the yarn, as I said, it sold out in less than 24 hours. There actually wasn't too much of it because I began, I think with about 50 pounds of fiber. Uh, so that didn't produce too too many skeins so they went off to all of you guys around the united states and i'm super excited to see what you make with them uh, a lot of you went with um the kits so you have um the hat pattern or the cowl pattern from albina mclaughlin of lb hand knits and i think she did a fa fabulous job with that uh pattern i think it really suits the yarn very well uh, so, the next installment of the Farm to Ski and Yarn is coming. <laughs> well, it, as with the last one, it's probably going to take six to eight months because uh, milling time always takes uh, longer than you expect. So right now, uh, I pretty much jumped right back in. I was kind of hoping or thinking I might wait, um, but I jumped right back in and uh, Kathy just had her shearing, so I was out at her farm. I saw these fleece and I uh, asked her if she was interested in you know, sending, selling some uh, fiber for a new yarn. And she said, sure. So she sent me her fleece inventory and I looked through it. And she's been um, really doing a beautiful job of breeding some Corydale um, Teeswater sheep. And so what I did is basically bought all of her fleece, <laughs> especially all of her Corydale and Teeswater. Um, lots of straight Corydale fleece. And then I think there are four or five fleece in the mix that are Corydale Teeswater sheep so the the blending has already happened on the fleece of the sheep um, there are many reasons why i think this blend of tease water and corydale is going to make for a beautiful yarn um, both sheep uh, they came into the u.s at different times so tease waters are more recent more like 1997 corydales of course came into the u.s back in the 19, 1914 or so like beginning of the 20th century uh, both of them are dual uh, purpose breeds so both were raised for both meat and fleece um, and what's the, the difference here is that tease waters are long wool fleece uh, and they have they will add like a lot of really cool luster to the yarn and if you wanted to dye the yarn it would add you know it would, it would take dye really well and reflect the light and create a beautiful dyed yarn um, Corydale has a nice crimp to it because originally uh, in Australia and New Zealand, Corydale was the product of breeding merino sheep with Lincoln sheep, a kind of nice cross. So you, you already have the long wool and the really soft, um, beautiful fine wool combined together. So then once you do it again with the Corydale and the Teeswater, you're going to get all of those great features of like good elasticity and memory, but also really beautiful luster. Um, and I think it'll make for a beautiful wool. So I want to kind of bring you along um, a little bit more on this fleece to skein, farm to skein yarn. Uh, and what I mean is that I wanna do an interview with Kathy, who's the shepherdess. Uh, I wanna show you some pictures of the sheep and just kinda get you involved in the, in the farm a little bit. 
Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'll insert a few photos of Kathy's sheep, uh, the cute Corydales and the Corydale Teeswater crosses. And I also have um, a Teeswater, just a, a straight Teeswater breed here to show you. And they're really quite cute. has the dark face, um, really beautiful curls on the long wool, I think you can see there. So I think this will, as I said, be a really cool yarn. Um, and I'll try to bring you along for it. What I'm going to do with the mill, I'm going to use the same mill. I talked to Deb at Stonehenge Fiber Mill up in Michigan. And what we're going to do is a uh, three-ply sport weight again, because I think that works both for sweaters and for all these accessories. It's really, it's like a perfect weight of yarn. Um, but we're going to do a gray this time. So we're going to do 85% uh, of the fiber is white and 15% is black. And for the black, I have a nine pound fleece from uh, Kathy. That's a beautiful uh, Corydell Teeswater blend. So it will be, it'll just blend right in with everything else. Uh, and so altogether, I think I have 64 pounds of fleece. So we'll see how that does. Corydell, um, often when you wash it, will reduce in weight by about half because of all of the lanolin that get washed, gets washed out um, and dirt and grease and all that, other, you know, all that stuff. Um, so we'll see how much actual weight for yarn we have on the return package. But I can't wait to kind of keep, keep you up with the story and um, get you involved in the making of this yarn. So onward to our book segment. So all of 2019, every episode of the cast, I've been trying to bring you a rare or out of print or hard to find book and kind of tell you a little bit about it so that if you're interested in trying to hunt it down yourself, you know what you're getting into uh, and to share information because a lot of these books are rare or hard to find. Um, I happen to have a nice guild in town and uh, guild members are often getting rid of their stash for one reason or another and so I often collect the books that they um, are getting rid of and the books that they're getting rid of sometimes come from decades back, sometimes come from around the world, sometimes uh, they have a really great collection of something on lace or cables or just some really interesting stuff. So I've been able to collect some cool books over the years and those are often the ones that I'm sharing with you. Though I am actively hunting stuff down on like eBay and <laughs> just for the fun of it. Um, so today I have Whirl and Wheel, The Story of Hand Spinning in Scotland by Sue Grierson. And here's what it looks like. Whirl and Wheel. Uh, and this was, uh, I think this on, for, was for sale for something about $10 um, when she bought it. It looks like that's what the price tag says. Uh, but it was published in 1985. Uh, and it's one of these books that I think she actually picked up in Scotland. Um, because, yeah, it was printed in Scotland by Oliver McPherson Limited. So my guess is that she either picked it up in Scotland or got it online somehow from a, a, a bookseller. Um, what I will tell you about this book is that I thought at first it dealt mostly with, um, you know, basic spinning techniques, but it really does go into the history of spinning in Scotland. So uh, there's a really great section on sheep and some of the sheep that were used in Scotland most prominently. Uh, they begin talking about the Soay sheep, S-O-A-Y, uh, which is a pretty interesting breed, a feral flock uh, out on the isle, island of Soay. Uh, and because it was a feral flock, it rued rather than needing to be sheared. So the people would go out and pluck the, kind of pull the fleece. It just naturally breaks at a certain time. Uh, that's how ruing happens. You don't need to shear the sheep. Um, but then there's lots of talk of like crossing, crossbreeding with Roman sheep, the sheep that the Romans brought over. So Dunface sheep, Old Scottish, short wool sheep. Uh, and eventually these things revolve into like the North Ronaldsea sheep or Shetland sheep. Um, Blackface, Cheviots. I mean, there's, there's like a massive amount of sheep diversity, sheep breed diversity that's happening in Scotland. And this is, I mean, she's kind of starting from the 14th century all the way up to the 19th century um, and a little bit into the 20th century. So uh, there's a lot of diversity in sheep. There are a couple things in here that I thought you guys might appreciate. This, uh, after she talks about the sheep breed, she, she just has a section called smearing. And I thought, what in God's name is that? Uh, so apparently before uh, 1850, when uh, farmers used to start dipping their sheep to help prevent uh, things like um, sheep scab or other parasites and diseases, um, before that, before the sheep dipping, there was sheep smearing. <laughs> and definitely not something that sounds really um, palatably fun, but if it works, it works. 
Uh, so how do you make a sheep's smear? You take 14 pounds of butter, usually made from sheep's milk, melted with a, a gallon of tar, and it's said that a man could smear 35 sheep in a day. Other mixtures recorded are pine tar, brown grease, spirits of tar and whale oil, and tobacco juice and soap with tar. So you'd smear the sheep with this to prevent the diseases or parasites, but then what happens when you go to shear the sheep or to pull off any of the the wool for, from like rowing or whatever it is? Uh, basically it created really poor fleeces, as you could imagine. Um, so in 1770, wool from the highlands was reported to suffer a loss of 50% in the scouring, and if it had been tarred, then 62% was said to be lost. Um, scouring was generally done with urine and water, possibly alkaline plants or seaweed ashes, but the dirty wool did not go to waste. Uh, in a booklet written for housewives in 1676, the author Gervais Markham instructed them to cut out and save all the tarred locks, pitch feltings, etc., and make them into coarse coverlets. What a task. <laughs> so that's uh, sheep smearing for you. You can learn all about it in this book. Um, but she also talks about muckle wheels, which uh, is another word for a great wheel or a walking wheel, which I, I was not familiar with that term. And she talks about pirin wheels, P-I-R-N wheels, which were spinning wheels that were used for winding uh, yarn onto uh, bobbins for weaving. So actually using a spinning wheel for that. And she also talks uh, towards the end about different traditions, Shetland knitting, um, tartan, plaiding, um, weavers, the bonnets, all kinds of different, really specifically Scottish um, craft items. Uh, so the last thing I want to mention about this book in terms of contents is that it has a section on spinning schools, which were set up in the 1700s or 18th century, um, really as a way to help fight poverty. So they were they um, brought equipment to some of the villages uh, and they brought education to some of the women who were then able to spin, learn to spin. Some were more successful than others. Um, she talks about um, that in Iverness, uh, one of the most successful spinning schools was there and it taught 184 girls to spin in 1753. Poor girls were provided with wheels and reels and country girls were given free accommodation. Um, and it really was just a way to like kind of spread spinning and spinning wheels and equipment out into um, the villages of Scotland, which is kind of cool to think about. Um, here are just a couple of the other illustrations from the book. This is someone spinning, this is some of the beautiful uh, this is Shetland lace, I think. Yeah, hand spun, knitted Shetland shawl. Um, and she has t uh, some other illustrations about specific kinds of wheels that were pretty unique looking. That one is an unusual style of wool, wool wheel with a boomerang support, uh, which came from the museum officer at Orkney, um, B.S. Wilson. Uh, so it's the, the Tankerness House Museum. Uh, provided that photograph. So there are some really cool um, bits and bobs in here about spinning in Scotland and I think it's just a kind of cool book. I don't know where you'd get it or um, how interesting it would be to um, someone who wasn't interested in spinning, but if you're interested in like place specific spinning and some of the ways that um, knowledge and technology kind of get produced and moved around a country, this is a really great book. Um, so very cool kind of addition to the 2019 um, book segment on the cast, I think. Um, all right, the last kind of segment before the giveaway today is that I wanted to talk about Jen Arnold Culliford, Year of Techniques, the second year. Uh, and the reason I, I talked about Jen Arnold Culliford um, a few podcasts ago, and she is the designer behind the Bruton hoodie, which uh, we did a giveaway for. And the Bruton hoodie uh, is a beautiful hood, that hoodie that like a sweatshirt that um, is kind of like unisex. You could wear it if you're a, a guy or a lady. Uh, and I really just liked the her kind of technique and her um, style. And so I got in touch with her and we started talking. And she's, uh, as I said on the other cast, she was the She's a technical editor as well, and she's tech edited patterns from a lot of your favorite designers. She just, she's kind of like an amazing woman. Uh, so well, after we did our interview and the giveaway, uh, she offered to send me the Year of Techniques um, and I could share them as I wanted to. So I wanted to talk to you about the March edition and kind of give you a preview of what this Year of Techniques um, looks like so that you know if you're interested in getting in on it. Um, it's not that expensive and you could do it either as a paper copy if you wanted to get the book or you can do it as an e-copy which is what I'm seeing on my Ravelry feed. Uh, and because of that, what I get in my inbox are 
you know, there's like a welcome package and then there's uh, each month there's a new technique and the techniques come with tutorials and patterns that you can use to kind of practice. So this month um, the technique is a tuck stitch and a tuck stitch is actually, I didn't know this, but a tuck stitch is a type of brioche stitch. Um, and in some of the materials that Jen sent along, she talks about how um, the tuck stitch, which has kind of like risen to prominence a little bit more now in hand knitting, I think, um, was often used by machine knitting, uh, but uh, not so much in hand knitting. So it's kind of like um, a really interesting technique that's kind of, ha it's on the rise, I think, for hand knitters. Um, it produces a double-sided kind of fabric. Basically, the, the fabric looks good on both sides, so it's, it's great for any kind of accessory or knitted object that you it's going to be seen on both sides so like things like sweaters cowls um all those kinds of good things and you can use two colors for it just like you can with brioche so there's lots of really cool um information about the type of stitch that you're learning one of the things that you get in the package you also get um she has great technique um pdfs that she sends tons of really well lit photographs that go you, that take you step by step through how to do a tuck stitch. And I'm not really a visual learner like in terms of from learning from books when it comes to actual stitches, um, but these are incredibly clear. And if you learn differently, like I learn from people or from videos as for each technique, uh, a, a tutorial video set up. So you can just go watch the video and watch her knit and then <laughs> learn how to do the technique. So it's like, it's a really well-rounded, um, uh, thing to kind of get into this year of techniques because you learn so much um, and then the pattern from this time around is the Brahmin cowl and likely you've seen it on Instagram because it's been making the rounds it is a beautiful two color cowl and it is in the tuck stitch and it's just a really sweet little cowl that um, doesn't look too complicated to make especially if you can master the the stitch techniques through either the photograph tutorial or the video tutorial so you're just getting a lot of information and this is just the first installation for this year's um, year of techniques so I would highly recommend it you can look up the Brahmin cowl um, I'll put the name of it here and put the link in the show notes if you want to check it out um, over on Ravelry just to see what the pattern looks like and see other project pages um, but it's a good one it looks like uh, this year of techniques is going to be awesome and if you love this second year of techniques she also has a first year of techniques that I haven't personally checked out but I can only imagine they're great given what I'm seeing in this second year of techniques so something to think about if you're especially if you're um, feeling like you're knitting's in the doldrums or you're just learning wanting to learn something new or you want a little motivation every month um, finding something like this in your inbox might be a fun thing to do to treat yourself to Okay, I think we're at giveaway time, and this episode, our giveaway is sponsored by Two Frenchy Fibers, Cheryl of Two Frenchy Fibers. Uh, we got in touch over Instagram, and I did an interview with her um, over on the blog that you can go check out, and she offered to send some of her beautiful yarn for giveaway, so I'll show you this one. This is called Tiptoe Tulip. I think, you can, I think the camera's actually catching that pretty well. It is a beautiful, it looks almost like a gradient from this beautiful pink through the purple to the blue beautiful and there <laughs> there are the two little Frenchy dogs that kind of inspired the whole thing uh, she if you'll read over on the interview she has these two adorable Frenchies and that's where the name came from uh, and a lot of her colorways she said are inspired by her travels this is the mini skein set that she sent along and this one's called cosmic fantasy these are both superwash uh, this one is a two ply 463 yards and these mini skeins are they look like two ply too. Yes, two ply. And it's 200 yards altogether. And this one has merino nylon in it. And this one has merino nylon. They're both 75-25 merino. Oh, this is 75-25 merino nylon. This is 80-20 merino nylon. So I've got these two. And I have some beautiful stitch markers sent from Cheryl. Purple and a blue set. So what I would like to do is give away both We'll do two winners. So one person will win the mini skeins and a set of stitch markers, and someone else will win the big skein and a set of stitch markers. And what I'd like you guys to do is go over to Cheryl's um, Instagram page and like her on Instagram, like follow her on Instagram, and then leave a comment here telling, uh, telling us which of her colors you like the best. And you can go visit her website for that. Uh, these are just some of her pretty colorways. Let's see if the camera can capture them. There you go. Uh, and she does do custom orders. They're quite pretty. So what I'm gonna do is I'll leave a link to the Etsy shop 
here. I'll put it on the screen. I'll leave it down below and I'll put it in the show notes. And you just head over to her shop, leave a comment with um, your favorite colorway, and please uh, like her on Instagram or follow her on Instagram so that um, you can keep up with all the things that she's doing over there. We will close the giveaway in about two weeks and uh, I will announce the winners by random numbers drawing <laughs> at that point. And by the way, the winner of the giveaway for the last giveaway, which was a skein of shorn yarn and a pattern, was Kevin. And Kevin, um, I think he's already gotten his yarn because I sent it out to him last week, so hopefully he got it and he chose the uh, cowl pattern for his pattern. So Kevin, I hope you enjoy your yarn. I hope everyone's enjoying shorn. And I think that's it for today. So happy knitting until I see you again and I'll talk to you soon.